All right, welcome to the latest episode of the Home and Power Organic Fitness Podcast. I have my latest guest here in front of me, okay? We have Dr. Christie, Director of Education and Research at Airfield, based in the capital, Dublin. Yeah thanks. yeah, thanks for having us, uh, having me on. I'm really looking forward to the chats. Yeah, I suppose uh, what I want you to do firstly is, I suppose, explain where you're currently based and what you currently are doing uh, at the likes of Airfield. So absolutely. Airfield Estate is a urban farm. We're based in the suburbs of Dundrum. We can see Dundrum Town Centre just across the road from ourselves, uh, just inside, tucked inside the M50. Uh, we are aiming to be Dublin's sustainable food hub in a sustainable food city. And so for us, that means bringing the public in on a daily basis and showing them how their food is made. So we farm organically and regeneratively on the estate. Uh, we have fruits, vegetables. Uh, we have a Jersey herd producing our own pasteurized milk on the estate. We have um, our pigs and our lamb and our own eggs and all of that goes into the restaurant on the estate. And if it doesn't get used in the restaurant, it goes into our farmer's market, which is on every weekday uh, or every weekend from on Fridays and Saturdays from half nine to half two. That's an absolute <laughs> mountain of, I'm going to say, walk this involved in there between animals, between vegetables, fruit, and we're certainly bringing in the likes mm -hmm. of individuals to schools, which is the next thing I'm going to touch on. Because mm -hmm. literally education is so, so important. And it's great that you literally, how many students did you have in to the likes of Airfield Estate there last so year? So we have 12,000 students visit us every year. Um, we have 320,000 visitors visit us annually uh, between the gardens, the farm and the restaurant. Uh, we are busy <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's, it's great, you know, like honestly, it's fantastic. The fact that we're hemmed in on all sides by houses and the Lewis line um, and a road, you know, like there's 38 acres of these lungs in Dundrum that are just breathing out, you know, biodiversity and fresh air and food and all of that. And so when people come along and visit just as a daily basis, they um, they can see what we're doing you know, all through the year. It's not just about the kind of high highlights of the year of lambing and calving and harvest. It's all the work that goes into food production throughout the year, the preparation, the management, the the balancing act that is, you know, everything to do with fertilizing and making sure that the ground is well, you know, prepared for whatever is coming next next whether that's crops or animals so it's fantastic to get people in and see it and those school groups are everything from preschool up to primary and secondary and university groups um, and we also then run adult classes and children's and teens classes around cooking and foraging and food and everything that you could possibly think about we do <laughs> That's amazing. And I love the fact that firstly, it's organic because I, I'm an organic grower myself based in the likes of Kildare. I would also have a similar mindset of getting people to understand where food comes from. And it's not literally the highs of the lovely lambing or the lovely summer pick and harvesting of the tomatoes. It's more so the whole 12 months of the year that there's things going on. The adding of the farm manure, the likes of your wood chip in the paths that are encouraging the likes of the beneficial microorganisms that people don't know enough about because without the beneficial microorganisms, there's no life in the soil, there's no life in the soil, there's best, uh, much more likely to have pests and diseases. And that's something that's not often talked about. And that's why people such as yourself working and being a part of this whole organic regenerative agriculture process is so, so important. Absolutely. And, you know, I'd love to say that it's all me. It's not. There's a, there's a <laughs> dedicated team of fantastic people, of experts in the farm and in the gardens that do Trojan amounts of work to make sure that everything not just it, is not just producing, but is also looking pretty at the same time and is looking you know pleasing to the eye because we are a tourist destination. We are somewhere where the public want to come in. So there's no real back of house for us. Everything is on display. So we need to we, we need to be be like really conscious of that and make sure that it's a nice visit for people as well but you know the the things that you were talking about there we the farm and garden or the gardens the production gardens themselves have been organic for a few years now um 
the farm part with the with the livestock we're going through organic transition at the minute and um, and so that's been really interesting for us because we were already practicing organic in insofar as that the practices we were using were organic we just didn't have the certification but now we're going for that certification on that land as well so it's being part of an educational charity and an educational institution, we're bringing people on that journey with us. We want to explain to people, this is what we have to do. You know, these are the changes that we have to make. This is the, you know, the reason why we don't have animals packed into every single field within here. It's about giving them space. It's about giving, making sure, like you were talking about, that we have, you know, a healthy soil that's packed full of biodiversity. And um, I was at the the soil biodiversity conference in ucd last week and they were pointing out that 25 percent of the biodiversity we have in the world is under our feet and so we're not going to be able to fix the biodiversity on top of the soil if the biodiversity under the soil isn't right either so by combining organic and regenerative farming methods for ourselves we really feel that that's that's really the key to making sure that we're able to not just you know, maintain the production that we're having on the farm and gardens at the minute, but also improve the soil and improve the, the plants and animals in the future as well. Yeah. And I was only actually on to an organic uh, orchard grower based down in Waterford. David, his second name is after um, <laughs> evading me, but um, he is well, certainly incorporating, uh, I love this method, of controlling slugs. He has geese and he has hens. Amazing. He allows into the orchard and he also has vines as well that literally mm-hmm. pick up the slugs, the snails, and that is for some people like how do people grow and these uh, and use these methods to produce healthy, I suppose, crops. And I'm, I was just like, that's such a vivid thing, uh, uh, image for me to see animals grazing around the grass, picking up yeah. those uh, pests, so slugs and snails, so that mm-hmm. they can. I suppose it does, and that's feed, that's protein, which never really gives a, a feedback or a produce back to the likes of the eggs. Yeah, absolutely. And through the fertilization of their poop as they walk around, you know, like it's really, it's a beautiful thing. And that's the nice thing about the regenerative farming method that we're using at the minute is that it it, it involves livestock. It's not just about going completely plant-based and removing that from the system. It's about acknowledging that actually livestock are intrinsic to this. They need to take that organic matter, they convert it inside them into, into useful products for us. In our case, um, you know, when you talk about our, our dairy herd, uh, milk and eventually beef that goes into the restaurant as well um, but they're also putting that that poo that fertilizer back onto the land for us which is providing food for those microorganisms and organisms that live in the soil so really important for us that we tell people about it and one of the things that we're doing actually it's opening hopefully in May now is our soil exhibition so we will be bringing people into three domes which kind of makes you feel like you're going in underneath the ground and we're going to talk about how important soil is um, and how if the soil's not right, the plants won't be right and the animals won't be right and we won't be right. So we need to make sure that we're doing something that is feeding that soil because there's lots of like there's lots of statistics out there about how, you know, we're utilizing the soil um, poorly for for intensive agricultural purposes across the world, not 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 kind of just in Ireland, but across the world. And we really only have a limited amount of harvests left before that soil becomes completely useless and we have to put in um, fertilizer into it in order to get it to, to produce anything. We don't want that to happen. So we're gonna get the public excited about soil, which uh, which people are, are a little bit wary about. <laughs> I'm not sure that soil is very sexy, but we will be making it thrilling for people. We'll bring them in, we'll show them what they're doing, how, you know, how soil is produced, uh, what are the parts of soil, and then we'll get them to start pledging about how they can change their behavior to look at how they can make soil better in the future as well so things like going organic buying more organic produce composting using their brand bin using the compost in their garden and um, avoiding food waste wherever possible so that we're not taking nutrients from the soil and necessarily to create food that will ultimately be wasted all of that sort of stuff and so we're going to get people really excited about soil <laughs> I suppose even like I, I love touching on that point is the fact that growing your own and most certainly would be something that is such a simple thing whether you have a small meter squared raised bed or you wanted to grow in pots that would be a way of shortening your food waste I mean, definitely the idea that organic food for some people can be expensive well I would touch that point if anybody doesn't have the equivalent of two euro I would give them them two euro to most certainly buy those packets of seeds and everybody then teach them to save their own seeds which I would do here 
mm-hmm. the likes of uh, any of the grow your own courses. But that's just it. It's about utilizing what you currently have, getting your hands on the best type of food you possibly can. That is not only beneficial for you, but it's also majorly beneficial for the environment. That's it. And, you know, and it's about getting people to realize that they can they can actually change themselves. And, you know, people say, you know, like and, and they're right. We're living in a cost of living crisis at the minute. You know, and food is more expensive. You know, like, are they going to choose organic produce over or over a cheaper alternative? But we're saying to them, you know, like food waste can cost an Irish household up to about 730 euro a year. So if you're reducing your food waste, that should release some of that income to be able to go and spend it on things like organic organic food. So why not just redistribute it and let's be a little bit smarter about it. Let's, let's buy one organic thing in your shopping. You know, even that simple move will help, you know, like just increase the amount of organic produce that, that shops will supply and that is helping, you know, being produced in, a, in an environmentally friendly way. Yeah, most certainly. And it's about connecting with the likes of your local grower and going to the likes of these country markets and connecting back where food actually comes from. Because really and truly, some people don't realize the effort and the time and the can, the, the energy that goes into it. And yeah. this year for myself, I actually firsthand took Dexter Animals organic food registered from a farm in mm-hmm. from a lovely, I don't know, it's about five acre field into a trailer and down to the slaughterhouse. And I tell you, you know what I mean, I'd be a fairly tough, hardy individual. And it's one of those things that you will never waste an ounce mm-hmm. of that produce because you know this beautiful animal, how long it's been in that field, they have to bring it down to an abattoir. And that's the thing that people don't see and say, oh, I don't want to see that. Well, then we might, might be a hell, of a hell of a lot less food waste if people did actually realize that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a beautiful quote and, and I can't unfortunately remember where I heard it, but there was this idea that someone was was talking about like, doing that exact thing like and and asking them like how could you eat that meat like of an animal that you knew and they turned around and they were like well how do you eat meat of an animal you don't know I love it yeah and I thought that was so that's exactly it like we need to actually understand where our food comes from we need to know that the animal lived well died well and was used well you know and that we want to make sure that that entire animal is used as well and that's one of the great things about the restaurant here on the estate is that when the when our dairy animals get to the end and we have jersey animals so they are definitely not beef animals by any stretch of the imagination but when the cull cows are are heading off at the at the end of their at the end of their lives we bring them back into the restaurant and so we have our you know our cull cow kind of beef lasagna we have our our beef burgers and things we want to make sure that that entire animal has, util- has been utilized properly on the estate. And that's really, really important to us. And so we'll get back every single part of it as well. So we'll get back like the tongue, the heart, all of that sort of stuff and we'll, and we'll, util- and we'll use them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's something that we used to do years ago, pa- liver pate, the idea of people having liver for a certain, t- and is one of those things, a complete protein and people might turn their nose of it now. And it would be one of the cheaper cuts of meat, but people sometimes just want food that's cheap, but really and truly, mm-hmm. Food is never cheap. And if it is cheap, further, we can touch on this, yeah. like so the soil is after losing out either the harsh yeah. chemicals or it's been like to so the sprays, mm-hmm. or pesticides, herbicides. And again, we're talking about life is in the soil. And that's what we're trying to, I suppose, get people back to realizing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so one of the big things that we do here, like I said, is 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 educating people and getting people involved in in their food and where it comes from. So with the school visits, they have to come to the estate. And we were kind of we were thinking, like, how do we how do we make how do we let more people know about where their food is coming from? And one of the programs that we run is called Farmer Time. And Farmer Time is this amazing program that um, we link a farmer directly to the classroom and they have a phone call with that farmer every two weeks virtually um, over over Skype or Zoom or or even WhatsApp video Um, and they get into the classroom and they talk about what's happening on the farm every two weeks with that class and that program stretches from junior infants all the way up to like leading cert um, ag science they've also been HE classes that have been using it in second level as well And it's about getting those 30 students in that classroom to understand the whole relationship of farming and that whole where their food is coming from. And it's been really fantastic to see, especially with HE classes. Like one of the beef farmers we have um, is is paired with a HE class. And so they took a calf all the way through from birth 
all the way through to slaughter for those animals, for the for for those kids to see that and to see that process was brilliant because like even down to things like how many grams does it gain every single day? Like what is the farm? Like it's it's mad to think that they would be you know gaining you know almost a kilo a day, you know, like in, in, in their growth and just how, how is that possible? What's the farmer feeding them? How are they, you know, what, what, what makes this breed better than that breed? And just the whole process of bringing them out in the springtime, back in in the wintertime, what is the winter feed like? All of that is accessed within the classroom. They didn't have to go out on, you know, 16 visits to a farm to see that. They got to see that in the classroom and ask the questions. And that's invaluable. That kind of information and that experience, that long-term experience for students is so important because then what, what we hope will be the result of it, it's only been running for two years now. So in the future, what we're hoping is that when things happen in the media and farmers are, you know, being, you know, villainized for for having large amounts of livestock or their you know the greenhouse gases they'll be able to say well no I knew you know farmer Coleman like he would he's not like that at all you know he was he was showing us his his really biodiverse hedgerows and he was like you know all of his animals are super healthy and happy and they lived well and you know that's what we want that's how you change you know that urban rural divide that's how you you integrate it in you have to build those relationships and so we're doing it on the estate every day, but we wanted it to be outside. And so we have, you know, 90 farmers now across the country giving their time to, to schools across the country um, and just letting them have that insight into dairying and sheep farming and tillage and beef. And it's amazing. It's, it's yeah, it's really heartwarming to see. Yeah, no, it's great. And exactly that point, getting people and children more so connected to the likes of farms. And that's a super, I suppose, project that you're currently doing right now. And is there a high percentage of the individual farmers? Are they vegetable and or more, are there more organic farmers than conventional? Or what way does that currently uh, so, work out? Yeah. So at the minute, we're about 20 percent female male, which is which is great. We would love to see some more females because that really challenges the, the ideal for children sitting in the classroom and um, that you can have you can have girl farmers too and um, we also the majority are actually dairy farmers at the minute they seem like the most uh, excited to get involved in the project and um, but we have a high percentage of organic farmers as well and so um, one of the things that we're really looking for is to have that diversity when we're running the project we don't dictate what the farmers talk about it's about it's about being led by what the children are interested in and what the farmer is doing on the farm and tying that in with their education as well so that the kids get to see this is oh, that's the thing I learned about in school and that he's actually doing it so like when we were talking about maths the other day like one of the farmers sent a, sent the class his a map of his farm as well as all of the the cost for all the different fencing and he told them that you know he needed a fence every couple of meters he'd need you know one thing one string of barbed wire the rest of it you know this other type of wire and could they work out how much fencing he would need how many posts he would need and the cost of that so the kids went off and used their math skills that they've been learning in the classroom to work that out for him so they suddenly get to see why it's important to measure the, you know the circumference of that of the circle and the triangle and all the rest of it because now they're going to be using it in the in the real world and that was fantastic you know and and lovely little learnings they forgot to put in a gate you know so like they were real proud <laughs> at the end that they worked it out and then the farmer was like well that's great but like how do I get the animals in are they supposed to jump over the fence you know but it's lovely you know it's really that's a great learning for them too you know totally so, and making sure that it's Pythagoras's theorem that you're using in the corner <laughs> so she's at a right angle so she's not a skew ways kind of a gap <laughs> that's exactly it <laughs> oh, I, love so that. I think I'm coming yep. out in cold sweats thinking about that kind of maths but anyway you know it's good <laughs> God, you hope your math teacher's not listening now. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. But no, it's lovely. And those sorts of things are really important for us at Airfield because we really want people to, to enjoy the experience of learning about their food. You know, like it's not, if we can get so bogged down with like the cost of living crisis and the meat, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions from animals and how are we doing? And, you know, like it's just, it gets really, really negative really, really quickly. And yet there's so much joy. Like every farmer in Ireland, is you know loves what they do they're doing it because they're passionate about it they want to tell people about that and they want people to have a pride in what we're doing 
you know like the they are the guardians of the countryside um and you know we you know us urbanites we drive through it you know and we appreciate it from a distance but the, an awful lot of hard work goes into that so it's about joining up those two sets of people and having that conversation so that when they're in the supermarket making that split second decision between buying Irish and buying something else or buying organic and buying something else, that it actually isn't even a, a proper thought process for them. It's just, they instantly know that they should be buying Irish. They should be buying local. They should be buying seasonal. And we want that, you know, that connection to be instantaneous, but that's going to take time. So, you know, we just need to, to keep nudging all the time, nudging, nudging, nudging um, to get people to move towards that. Yeah, but you're doing the right thing, most well, certainly educating them there on site, as well as connecting farmers with the children in and just getting them to visually see things like, to, and hopefully, you know, we chatted separately, maybe even having the opportunity for the classroom, uh, sorry, the students from the classroom to go out to the farms because seeing one thing in a video is one, uh, I suppose, way, but Absolutely. literally hands on experience is the best thing that they're, they're yep. ever going to do. And I know with All that the school, smells. smells, yeah. <laughs> What is that smell? I can't believe it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like it's, it, um, and that's it, you know, like it's really about that experiential moment and people, once they've experienced it, will remember it, you know, so we have to, we have to get out there. So, so realistically now we're working towards, um, Airfields is working towards SDG 11, which is sustainable cities and sustainable communities. And so with that, we want to make sure that people understand what sustainability is, what it means, because there's an awful lot of different opinions out there what it is. We did research here um, a, a year or two ago and we actually asked our cohort. Now our cohort would be South Dublin. Um, they'd be well educated. They'd be buying into the sustainability aspect of things because they're coming to Airfield anyway, you know. So we asked 400 people in our restaurant, you know, what did they think sustainability was? The answers were all over the place. No one could actually tie it down. The lack of understanding about the terminology around food. So even simple things like we asked them what kind of fish they would like. So would you like wild fish, organic fish, farmed fish, tin fish, all this sort of stuff. And wild came out first, but then interestingly, organic came out second. But the last thing on their list was farmed fish. So they hadn't made the connection that in order to be organic fish, it needs to be farmed fish you know so they under they know the right words they just don't necessarily understand the context that it applies then to their food and um, and so there's an awful lot of unpacking to do you know to try and go past what the marketing is and actually get through to people about what their food is and why it's important and um, to to understand where it came from yeah, and the best thing I, for people, I always try to put it as simple because I'm a simple man myself, uh, being <laughs> dyslexic, but real, putting it to, down to the basics. The best thing you can possibly do is get things local. Best thing you can possibly do is get it fresh. The best thing you can do, gold standard, is get it organic. And I had Kira Shines, who most certainly is a, an Irish producer of uh, fish on the podcast previously and the idea that fish isn't sustainable well definitely i would say us living on an ireland ireland i know there'll be listeners here to this in the likes of america and some uh, listeners in australia but the point is for those of us in ireland we are in an island that literally is surrounded by fish and has kept us alive for thousands of years and the idea that saying that fish isn't something that we should add into our diet is nonsensical when people the same people are having avocados in their sandwiches or their wraps is or with their eggs or their sourdough bread it's crazy exactly. absolutely absolutely so it is and it is about supplying yourselves like one of the things we do here on this stage is we also we bring um we bring local parents in um to build their confidence around cooking and about supplying their families with food because during covid when all the schools shut down our our some of our local schools um, their children would have been part of the, the hot meal scheme. So they would have been getting their lunch through schools. And obviously when COVID uh, came and the schools shut down, that wasn't available to them. So Airfield opened up our kitchens and we started supplying the meals on wheels and cohorts in our area. And we also started supplying the schools. But after that, that's not enough for us. We wanted to make sure that if anything was like that, was to happen again we want those parents in that situation to be able to have the confidence to feed their families so not just about hammering into them that this is what's healthy this is you know like you need your five a day and this is a balanced meal and all the rest of it it was simply bringing it back to this is how you cut 
vegetables. This is how you cook, you cook vegetables in different ways. You know, like it's not just about boiling or steaming, you know, like there's other things that you can do with it. If a recipe says that you need X, Y, and Z and you don't have them, you can substitute this in as well. But that's simple, simple confidence around cooking, even the confidence to how do you store food properly? Like how do you store your leftovers correctly? You know, so you don't end up with food poisoning, all of that sort of simple, simple stuff. And that's, you know, that's the end of this story as well. And that like, you want people to not be afraid of food. Like it's very easy to go into a supermarket and pick up pre-made food, you know, and put it in your bag and then you stick it in the oven in the microwave or whatever, and you just produce it and there it is. But actually you need to know that you could make that yourself. You know, you could produce, a, you know, quick, easy meals from scratch that are healthy, that are seasonal, that are local and um, that, you know, are, you know, just like the simple act of going to your farmer's market and keeping, or even your grocer or your butcher in your local town, you know, that money that you're investing into that, into that local shop stays locally. It doesn't disappear outside of Ireland. So I think there's a statistic that says that if you're, if you're for every euro you invest locally, 70 cent of it stays locally. When you go in and spend it in like a, one of the larger retailers, only 14 cent of it stays locally you know so that's huge you want to make your your you want to make your community stronger buy local it's really really simple yeah and the idea that people if they most you know buying produce single ingredients is like we'd be on the same page people buying and making nutritious meals from that like go mm -hmm. back to the classics if you're people think oh yeah they wanted to be healthy they might skip breakfast skipping breakfast is not a healthy option because what ends up happening is the likes of other options throughout the day are available, whether it's passing the vending machine, passing the shop, and it's usually a convenience shop where we're getting fuel in the car, and there is the bars all over us, mm -hmm. and we have to hold off on choosing those colourful, bright, sugar, <laughs> chocolate-filled <laughs> biscuits, chocolate cakes, whatever's yeah. up on the counter, and that's that's the killer. So most people are, are not eating enough for breakfast. So literally, organic oats, very simple switch up to your diet, yeah. which costs in the difference of 50 cents if you are going to switch up to something more organic in on top of that local eggs if you had a space for a couple of chickens it's practically free food in on Absolutely. top of that literally just having a Saturday type lunch and then enjoying your lovely potatoes carrots turnips meats for dinner and you're on a winner that's real food it's real simple absolutely we we run a breakfast club here with our local schools our local dish schools and we bring them in they collect the eggs themselves they put them on to boil when they're cooking we go down to the farmyard they see the cows being milked we collect the pasteurized milk from the from the farmer we bring it back up we make butter with the cream to go on to the toast and within an hour and a half the kids have seen where, you know, like this healthy breakfast of eggs and toast and, you know, they've got their milk to drink as well. And all of that happens within an hour and a half. But on top of that, then we have the social learnings of sitting down, uh, eating together, using cutlery, conversing over food. Like food is this amazing teaching moment for people where it's not just about how healthy you are or, you know, like what you can do, but it's about, you know, by making one simple change, like having local eggs and toast for breakfast, like you're supporting a local person, you're eating healthier, you're, you know, like you said, you're not missing out on your breakfast, you know, like all of these things have much larger effects. And all you did was have toast and an egg for breakfast. Yeah. Do you know, like it's nuts. <laughs> it's the simple things. It's the simple things that people are not doing. And in a exactly. nutshell, that's, that's going to change not only their lives, but the future of, like, I suppose, the likes of the soil. And I suppose I'm just conscious of your time. Where is the likes of the best place for people to reach out to the likes of yourself or Airfield Estate so they can get and come to a visit? Excellent. So, yeah, so we have our website, which is www.airfield.ie, nice and simple. Um, and then we're also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, all as Airfield Estate. Um, so if you want to follow us on any of those platforms, they're the best places to keep up to date with us and all of our information and toings and throwings and all of our events and everything. Perfect. And thanks so much for your time, Michelle. And I always end these podcasts by saying stay tuned, stay classy and keep it organic. <laughs>